Hi folks. Uh, so I'm Alex Eiler. I'm from uh, one of the machine learning labs uh, here on campus, or here in the department. Um, uh, I'm going to speak for a lot of us, uh, since I think uh, Samir is also talking, but there's only a few slots, so not everybody got, to, got a chance to, uh, to present. Um, <clears throat> so um, uh, I think, you know, Many of you visiting, I think, are in machine learning. Uh, there's a, we have a, no, a number of students who are here. Um, it's an exciting time to be working in artificial intelligence or machine learning. Um, there's a tremendous amount going on, and things have really picked up in the last few years. Um, the number of AI labs in industry has skyrocketed, the amount of money that goes into them, and uh, the number of hires that they're making, uh, the, um, uh, the products that they're producing as well. Uh, are really starting to change um, uh, how people look at, at AI. Um, so, you know, recent headlines include things like AlphaGo, uh, which uh, beat the world champion Lisa Dahl in, in Go um, last fall. Um, <clears throat> autonomous driving, which uh, completely didn't work 10 years ago. Uh, so, back in 2004, uh, a whole bunch of university teams competed in the DARPA autonomous driving competition and not a single car finished the track, which was a completely open desert uh, track. Um, the next year, one, two teams finished, I think, um, and uh, a few years later, cars were doing um, urban driving and now people are just driving them around the town, right? The only problem now are, are laws. Um, so. Uh, the, the rate at which these things are, are changing, oh, sorry, uh, voice recognition also has made incredible leaps forward. Uh, now we have Siri, um, uh, Alexa, and so on that do uh, almost pretty excellent uh, voice recognition. Um, so uh, these kinds of advances have really changed um, what kinds of problems people can work on and, and really changed uh, how well any of these techniques work. Um, that's not to say anything is solved. There are a huge number of open problems and a huge amount of, of, uh, of important research still to be done, um, including uh, exploring the theoretical foundations and the practical aspects of things. So uh, algorithms and optimization are critically important to all these tasks. Um, probability and statistics underlie most of data science and machine learning. Um, cognitive science and decision theory, how we, make, how we reason and, and make decisions. Um, and uh, um, uh, make predictions about what we should do. Uh, all are, are at the fore of this. Um, so uh, let me just mention why you should come to UC Irvine, right? Uh, we have uh, a, a lot of outstanding faculty in machine learning and AI. Um, our faculty are throughout the editorial boards and the committees of the journals and conferences that are uh, in the top tiers of, of AI and machine learning and data mining and, and so on. Um, tremendous numbers of projects funded by the government, including NSF, NIH, Department of Energy, DARPA, and of course many industry labs as well now are, are funding things. Um, uh, so we are a, a long-standing department in machine learning. Um, we've had faculty working in machine learning uh, since long before it was hot. Um, and uh, so in fact, uh, we, we run the UC Irvine Machine Learning Data Repository um, and have for, for decades, and this is actually one of the most cited um, publications in computer science. Um, it's been used by tremendous numbers of machine learning algorithms. Um, uh, you have a large number of terrific fellow PhD students, uh, many of whom get p best paper awards at some of the top conferences, ICML, AI Stats, SIGKDDs, data mining, uh, SIGMODs, databases, um, uh, who are, um, uh, who, get fellowships from places like National Science Foundation uh, or IBM Research or Microsoft Research. Um, and our students then go on to either academic, academia or industry, uh, depending on their interests. So we've had a number of, of students. One of my students went to Dartmouth uh, just a few years ago. Um, and many of my students have gone on to industry, either Google or Facebook, uh, and do a lot of hiring. Um, and of course, uh, being in Los Angeles, we have a lot of research links to major research labs both here and around the country. Um, so lots of our graduate students go and intern at these for summers. Um, 
So I mentioned we have a lot of faculty. Let me just <laughs> throw a few of them out there. Um, so we have a, a center called the Center for Machine Learning and Intelligent Research, Intelligent Systems. Um, I'm currently director of the center, um, but uh, the center provides a, a loose conglomeration of faculty whose interests are in machine learning, artificial intelligence, uh, statistics uh, and other aspects. So um, these are just some of the faculty in the CS department. Um, so uh, myself and Rena Dechter um, work in uh, graphical models and approximate reasoning. Sorry, let me just just say we span a huge number of um, of application areas and uh, research emphases. Um, so these are sort of roughly grouped by uh, by area, but there's a, a lot of blur and a lot of overlap between us. So Rena and I work mostly in probabilistic models and reasoning, um, uh, scalable learning for myself, uh, Pork Smith, Samir. Samir works in natural language. We have a number of faculty who work in machine learning for computational biology problems. Um, a number of faculty who work in uh, computer vision, image understanding. Um, so they see a broad spectrum of, <coughs> of um, problem types and areas. Um, we also have a number of members of the center who are from different departments and interact closely with us, uh, participate in our, our seminar series and other things. So we have uh, close ties to statistics, which is just downstairs, uh, several members from cognitive science uh, who work on uh, language or the way people make decisions, um, members from mathematics and physics, sociology, social sciences, and more. Um, so I'm the spokesperson for the Center for Machine Learning, but we actually have a number of other machine learning related centers that we partner with. So uh, the Data Science Initiative, um, which is actually uh, run by Porrick Smith, uh, and uh, the Institute for Genomics and Bioinformatics, which is run by Professor Pierre Baldi, uh, all are uh, CS um, central uh, machine learning and data science um, uh, centers that organize activities and um, uh, uh, and encourage participation across departments and across campuses. Um, together, we run a number of workshops and symposia. So um, this was this one just happened, uh, run by the Data Science Initiative on machine learning and human behavior. Um, this one was last spring, um, uh, a large gathering of universities across Southern California um, uh, on machine learning and uh, um, uh, and data science. Um, we also run a more weekly seminar series uh, that meets, in fact, in this room. Um, on and so this has a, a a variety of people come through, both outside speakers um, and other faculty from the department or other departments on campus, as well as students who want to present their work and have the rest of the the school see what they've been doing. Um, so. Uh, so that's a sort of broad overview of what machine learning is like and how many faculty we have uh, here at UCI, or CS in particular, uh, working in machine learning and AI. Um, I thought I'd just spend a few minutes mentioning some of my research just so you get a flavor of, of the details of what uh, machine learning research looks like, at least from my perspective. So it's a very broad area, but I particularly work um, in algorithms, uh, statistics, and um, uh, probabilistic models. So almost everything that my lab does is about um, efficiently learning or reasoning in uh, models, probabilistic models over large systems. Um, so uh, we mainly work with tools, but because of that, our tools underlie uh, a lot of different types of area, uh, applications. So we have a current project on remote sensing where we observe satellite imagery and we're trying to predict uh, rainfall underneath to, to uh, give us a notion of the, the um, sort of now casting of weather. Um, we work some in computer vision. Uh, so you observe some image of the world and you want to figure out what objects are in it. Um, uh, so this is an um, a image classification problem. Um, uh, we also work in decision making and distributed decision making. So things like sensor networks. Uh, that measure their environment, and they need to decide what they're going to communicate to their neighbors, how they're going to collaborate to make a decision. Um, so as I said, all of these use a common set of tools, uh, and in my group that's uh, probabilistic graphical models um, and algorithms for reasoning approximately and efficiently and, and uh, learning in a scalable way with respect to data. Um, just a few kinds of models that we work on. So 
Uh, um, we've got recent work on uh, Boltzmann machines and restricted Boltzmann machines. So these are particular structured graphical models um, that uh, can be used to represent um, distributions over complex systems like images. Um, uh, you can build these layer by layer, so these are actually probabilistic models that are closely related to deep learning models if you know uh, deep learning methods. Um, so uh, in a paper that my student is presenting in a few weeks, um, we did an image completion model uh, using, these, uh, using these. So this is a very simple data set of digits and we've uh, uh, occluded some of them and the task is to sort of fill in the missing parts of the image. Although actually our model doesn't know that it's occluded, so it's mapping this measurement to the target image. So in fact, this is the same model we use in, um, in the uh, um, uh, rainfall prediction as well. Um, so we, uh, in my group, we do a lot of different algorithms, but one of the main ones we work on is an algorithm called belief propagation, um, which does local computations to try to approximate the, um, uh, the correct uh, probability values. Um, and we've done a lot of extensions to these kinds of algorithms, including letting them work with different objectives that are better for making uh, structured predictions uh, accurate. So um, belief propagation had been tried on models like this, um, but people had felt that it wasn't, uh, wasn't scalable enough um, and didn't, didn't work well enough. Um, our version of this algorithm is about 600 times faster than the previous implementation. Uh, was so it's now uh, quite competitive speed-wise with anything else, um, and the performance is better than any of the other algorithms that that have been used for it. So, um, you, know, you making a making a small change in algorithmic behavior can really change your performance. Um, another application, just to mention, that we work on uh, is crowdsourcing. Um, so the idea of crowdsourcing is um, to take uh, large groups of um, unskilled workers and ask them to uh, make predictions for you and then try to integrate those decisions. So this is often used in machine learning as a preprocessor to get data uh, that is clean and, uh, and high quality. Um, when I was a grad student, we used to all do it via experts. So the grad student would sit down and label data for a year. Uh, and this was the most expensive data that anyone ever generated. <laughs> uh, you've got a near PhD student wasting an entire year creating a data set. Um, so you'd like to just ask somebody who's not so good at the task, or at least who's not so highly skilled and paid, um, but you can't really trust the answers that they give you. Um, so this is sort of like, uh, like Amazon Turk. You can um, ask uh, random workers around the world to do work for you, but the answers that come back are not guaranteed to have had thought or time put into them. Um, so crowdsourcing, you try to take a large collection of these, you have multiple people work on the same jobs, and then you try to combine those and get some kind of um, more accurate uh, information out. So this also is a graphical model. Um, there's a notion that you have uh, workers, and workers work on tasks, and so these two interact in a way. Um, and the kinds of problems that we look at are things like, uh, how do we design this assignment graph? How do we, once we have this graph, how do we integrate the information we get from the workers to get the best possible predictions about the tasks? Um, once, uh, if, we're, if we're worried about the quality of the workers, can we use a small amount of expert information to so have our experts do a little bit of work? This is my graduate student. Uh, and uh, uh, decide to you know, get, do a small amount of work to assess which workers are high quality or not. Um, and once we've done that and gotten the answers, if we're not happy with them, can we use a small amount of, of targeted work from our expert to improve the job? Um, so this is a graphical model, and I just want to point out, so you know, how much can you expect to get out of, out of automated reasoning in a system like this? Well, if you just take the average of what people predict, you get a quality curve that looks like this. If you actually knew which of your workers was doing a good job, then uh, with, you know, uh, like an oracle tells you exactly which one, then you would get a quality curve that looks like this. So you can actually get a, a quite a significant gain in, in your performance per worker. Um, so our algorithm for this is this blue curve, so we get somewhere, somewhere about midway in between uh, simple voting and, and uh, uh, optimal information. 
Um, we also can look at problems like uh, if before you work, uh, you can answer some questions beforehand and then feed those to the workers without telling them you know the answer, then that can be used to score the workers. And so there's an underlying theoretical question of how do you balance that amount, right? If you, if you ask your workers too many questions you already know the answer to, you'll know a lot about your worker quality, but you won't have any work left over to answer the questions you want. If you don't ask them enough questions, then you don't know whether your workers are doing a good job when they give you the answers. Um, similarly, post hoc, you have a bunch of workers and a bunch of items. Uh, how do you target the information that you want to get? And there are sort of, again, two balancing concerns theoretically. Um, if you have items that you're very uncertain about, your, your expert can go in and resolve them, and that will help. But uh, if you have items that your expert goes in and resolves that are connected to a lot of users, you'll gain a lot of information about their quality. And then that information will propagate to other items. So uh, there's sort of two terms when you do the theoretical analysis that, that tell you uh, what the optimal choice is in terms of what items to pick are. All right, so I'll just wrap up there um, and mention again, uh, UC Irvine is a terrific place uh, for studying machine learning and artificial intelligence. Um, we have outstanding faculty and students, broad array of, um, of applications and uh, uh, research agendas, um, including people working in algorithms and theory, uh, people working in statistics, um, people working in applications like vision and natural language and biology. Um, and so I think that uh, if you come, you'll really enjoy it. Thanks.